intro. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. We're at the secret squirrel headquarters of Ethan Moses. That's my backyard. And here we are. We have a project to talk about. Yeah, so um, we've been working on the direct positive uh, color and black and white processes for regular photo paper for, oh, maybe a year and a half now, although that uh, had about a year of COVID and no work done. So I think this was before we met. Um, yeah. And I was really taken by a video put up by Don Frula. Um, maybe, Joe, you put a link to him yeah. in the description. Yeah. And then that led me to the APUG page or the Fotrio page. And that led me to you. And yes. uh, That's right. at, at some point, I read all 11 years worth of messages, which took me about four hours to catch up. Um, and then, you know, when we met, that was one thing we had in common yeah. already. So I was tinkering with that process of using hydrogen peroxide and, and black and white developer and had some success and some problems. Ethan brought some of his knowledge, his process knowledge to the picture and I think we were able to get better results from more consistent results with it. Yeah, we got we got way better which led to <clears throat> I think one product, uh, three or four prototypes and what, what we got today. Yeah. Um, so I think we started out with some black and white uh, reversal prints that we just did, uh, I think, with an OG 4x5. This was one of the very first ones of uh, Joe outside of my garage. Was that? There's a dead pigeon in my backyard. Oh, yeah, dead uh, pigeon. These were some early ones before I could really uh, bleach out the negative image, so we have these sort of uh, unfixed looking. Here's a nice one. Laura looks kind of like a tintype. Uh, it does. Yeah. Anyway, these were sort of unsuccessful, um, and we eventually made some improvements to the bleaching process. Yeah. I think one of the main improvements we figured out was to repeatedly go back and forth between the citric acid and the peroxide. And I think in the first time I was doing it, I was mixing the citric acid and the peroxide together. And we decided to keep them separate and just kind of go back and forth, <clears throat> back and forth until the negative completely clears, right? Right. And, you know? and so I'm no chemist, right? But I think the intuition was is that we were using citric acid and hydrogen peroxide together uh, to bleach and clear the negative image uh, on the paper. Uh, but the intuition was is that the citric acid and the hydrogen peroxide buffered each other, so they made them slower, and if the balance uh, was thrown off, they would just not work. So yeah. we separated them um, so we could get the full effect of each chemical, which kind of required that you went back and forth, uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, primed a layer, if you will, with citric acid, yeah. bleached a little bit, and yeah. back and forth until we got it totally clear. Um, this is a photo Joe took of me after a long day in the coal mines. Um, <laughs> yeah. But this was one of the very first ones we did that was yeah. really clean and uh, clear. Oh, we had yeah. the process dialed in. Yeah, um, that was pretty cool. <laughs> I remember that one. So then we were interested in this RA4 reversal process to, yeah. to do color. We, we had some momentum behind us and we started experimenting with that. You know, the first couple of exposures we did were incredibly blue because uh, the paper is tungsten balanced and uh, designed for uh, a negative which has a, you know, orange mask on it. Yeah, we spent a lot of time messing around with filters um, and different lighting. Uh, this was a picture of my buddy Gerson that I had the, you know, color in the right direction but wrong magnitude. Yeah. Um, and then we started doing some mixed light stuff. Um, these are again are all just shot on a handheld 4x5 camera and processed in a tray. Um, and then we started really dialing things in with a studio flash uh, so that the color would be the same every time and kind of got the filtration pretty pretty clear. Yeah. So, so we kind of had both of these processes dialed in and um, we were just shooting all of these except for that 8x10 of me on cameras we had and hadn't yeah. designed anything for the process. Um, and I think the original idea, and I was talking to the Homemade Camera Podcast guys about this, but we were talking about the idea of an Afghan box camera, right? right. Uh, which right. was a classic video of yeah. yours yeah. that I really like, and I, I enjoy using your camera. Uh, do you want to recap a little bit about that camera? Yeah, the Afghan box camera was basically my version of what has been used in some of these countries for decades and maybe over a, a century or more. We were interested in 
uh, maybe making it a little more flexible and making some new innovations to that. But you had this interesting idea. Yeah, well, so I had been obsessed with Afghan box cameras or Cuban Polaroids, whatever you want to call them, a camera with a developing box in the back since I was a little kid. I think in like Pop Photo in maybe 2001 or 1999, somewhere in there, I saw an article about it, uh, about Cuban street photographers, and I've been wanting to do it ever since. And like way before I met Joe, I saw his uh, Afghan box camera series on YouTube and was really into that. And so, you know, once we had this process dialed in, I thought, okay, let's build an Afghan box camera, but like I'm a little bit of a megalomaniac. Why not build a 20 by 24 one? Um, right. One of my favorite photographers who passed away uh, recently is Elf Elsa Dorfman. Mm. She shot almost exclusively with a 20 by 24 Polaroid, which, you know, they don't really make media for anymore. And I would like to make, you know, if not an exact copy, like a replacement functionally for that, be able to make a direct positive, not instantaneously, but within a few minutes of yeah. uh, exposure and make one huge. And so... Um, I don't have those sketches, but we did, like, I did a couple of sketches on how big and how heavy an Afghan box camera would have to be for 20 by 24. And Joe, how, how big is your uh, image size on your Afghan box camera? <laughs> right now it does 4 by 6. That's pretty big. But, yeah. I mean, the camera is, what, 25 pounds? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's a big box, right? And so to scale that up, um, you know, one, a 20 by 24 might use something like an 800 to 1,000 millimeter lens which might focus, uh, you know, around seven feet when you're doing a one-to-one -one portrait. Yeah. Um, and so, like, now your box is seven feet long, plus you have to get your arms in, right? My right. shoulders are only yeah. so wide. Right. And so, like, the original yeah. idea was, okay, you need at least a 20 by 24 area for the trays. Right? Well, first we thought, yeah. thought about stack trays and, like, picking yeah. it up and, like, yeah. moving it around. Right. Just, it'd just be really awkward. So yeah. we thought about vertical slots. Right. Um, and then we also thought about um, PVC pipes that, had like screw flanges in the bottom of the camera that would screw in uh, with an end cap and then you would taco the the image yeah, kind of right. you know like, like that, that. Yeah. and stick it in the pipe but anyway we sliced it it's when, a lot of liquid and a lot of weight yeah we calculated yeah. somewhere between 70 and 150 pounds of chemistry even like at a, at a bare minimum for this sort of system and yeah. like a seven foot long box like you know it, it's the size of my shop and then where do you have room to like put somebody to shoot and like probably we want to shoot outside the shop and so yeah we needed a different yeah. different system to right. be able to do this right um and that led us to thinking about um i got this idea uh, based on like a camera that was made maybe the late 1800s early 1900s where um, it was like a pinhole or, or a very cheap single lens camera, single image use, like a probably bent sheet metal type of camera. I've never seen one in real life, only on the internet, where you take the picture and turn it, and then they had like powder developer and you would pour it into the camera and like get one picture. It was a one time right. use thing. I think it was a French camera. And so I got to thinking about this. They hadn't made cameras like this in like a hundred years. Uh, we have Polaroids now, or we used to have Polaroids. And so I thought about the idea of what if we had a camera back uh, that worked like, you know, a, a standard large format film holder that was also a developing tank that you could actually pull off of the camera. Because I'm not going to take a 7 foot long 20 by 24 standing on its back and start pouring pitchers of water. And it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. But like you could pull the, the tray out. And so I made this thing as just a little proof of concept, which actually turned into a couple of Ethan and Joe videos yeah. and a product I've sold a few thousand dollars worth of accidentally. Um, but, you know, this was just built as a proof of concept, uh, but this was never designed to be a product. It's a pinhole camera. There's a pinhole here. Um, and then there's a dark slide shutter behind the pinhole. And then it's a sliding box with a baffle so no light can get in. You just put your piece of paper in the back here. What makes it self-developing is that the pinhole is actually on a screw cap. So you would put your paper in the back, uh, take your picture as normal with any pinhole, close the shutter, and then the shutter closes entirely behind the screw cap. And the screw cap has a little uh, pinhole piece of aluminum in the back. And then you've got this uh, light baffle, which works like a developing tank, so it lets liquid through. And, it's a pore spout. Yeah, liquid and no light, and so you can blow through it, but you can't see through it. 
and then you pour uh, screw this on and then pull this guy out and you can develop pictures right in there yeah. and um yeah i mean that became like a successful product and i thought like okay we're on a roll yeah but the this the idea works you know the next prototype we made was an eight by ten uh self-developing <clears throat> film holder yeah so the idea is that a film holder that's a little that's thicker or deeper than a standard film holder that has a light tight pore spout you load a sheet of paper in there you expose the picture in the holder that acts as a film back and then you pull it out of the camera and pour chemicals right into the film back yep right? Yep, and yeah. I think we did a bunch of these. I think you did a video that's a demo of it at QLab, mm -hmm. and then we did. <clears throat> we actually built a sliding box camera in eight by ten that I called the Copycat, which was a knockoff of a Joe camera, which <laughs> is like a classic design from the eighteen hundreds. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, the prototype we made, and this one is really broken. It worked great for maybe a hundred exposures, but. You know, it was never ready for market, not because it didn't work, but because it just wasn't durable and it was very expensive to uh, manufacture. But basically, you know, it looks like a regular 8x10 film holder and it has the same outline in the front and the same light trap. We made this thing and a shim, so a normal 8x10 film holder is about 5 millimeters from the flange where it meets the camera back to the film. And this one, I forget, was 25 or 30. Yeah. Yeah. It pushes the uh, normal uh, focusing screen back so that it's in... The same plane as the paper would be right. in the thicker back here. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, this has a normal dark slide like anything. And the way we attach the paper is there's a little pocket in here. It's hard to see because it's black, but a pocket for a sheet of paper. Um, and then this frame went on top of it. And it had some embedded magnets that would yeah. just... Some uh, jump rare earth place. magnets that are very strong and holds it in place. Yeah. Yep. And then in this corner, there was a 3D printed baffle. The baffle's still there. It had a screw piece here that broke off. It uh, acts like a funnel, basically. Yeah. But so you would stick it in the camera, uh, pull the dark slide out, take a picture, put the dark slide back in, and pull it out of the camera. And then um, where there used to be a uh, screw uh, like tube, um, this funnel would screw on, kind of like that. Um, and then you just stick like a it bedpan down. funnel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Lady John. Um, <laughs> so this funnel would screw on, and you'd pour your chemistry in here and develop uh, images. And so we can show actually some yeah. images that came out of uh, this box with uh, Joe's sliding box camera. So the first one is this one we showed you a little earlier. This was um, a Chad yeah, picture that Joe took. That's uh, his alter ego. Uh, this was my friend Gerson, who's a really excellent photographer in yeah. his own right. Yeah. Um, oh, here's one I shot of Joe. Oh, yes. I like this one. Wearing the shirt that wasn't maroon colored. Yeah, and with this little um, light, flare, yeah. light flare from a crinkled uh, color filter. <laughs> um, That's actually pretty cool. Here's a nice one that was yeah. uh, a little under bleached that I did at QLab of my friend Adric. That's and, nice. Oh, this one is, I think, my favorite is... Uh, me working in the coal mines that Joe the, shot. The coal mine shot, that's yeah. right, yes. Um, and I, I think, like, at this point, we had, I don't want to say mastered, but we had become really competent at um, both the color and the black and white yeah. process. Yeah. Um, in fact, we even made a homemade lens, uh, which will come maybe in a few months. Yeah. Um, oh, I think there's some improvements that's to be made bad. from this that's lens. A good picture, but, right there. Yeah, this is not a bad 8x10 lens that we made pretty cheaply of Joe. Um, oh, here's another good one of Chad. What a handsome guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's Chad in his prime right yep. there. That's Chad. So uh, those all came out of that 8x10 back. And I had been planning on um, building a field camera and an 8x10 back, but like really I wanted to do a whole suite of products and yeah. then COVID hit and we didn't hang out for a mm -hmm. while and yeah. I got this laser and now I can't get to my darkroom sink and so the project kind of sat on hold for a long time. Um, yeah. I think we tried to pick it back up in December for about a week, uh, that's December of 2020, and we started prototyping a different version of this, um, this 8x10 uh, back but that might be a little nicer in four by five. And we tried to scale it down and like kind of got this far and didn't even glue it and gave up. 
and went back to the drawing board. And I actually, uh, this is a total waste. I just put it out. I actually saved our drawings from 12, 29, 20. Oh, nice. So yeah. um, we were trying to make a film holder and we have some ideas for light traps. Um, yeah. You had come up with all sorts of different seal mechanisms that were completely impractical to manufacture. Uh, yeah. I thought they were very clever, and, yeah. but they would also cost like $800 per unit. Yeah. And so I said no to most of, the, of these, but uh, it was nice to just take a day, know we had failed, knew we weren't going to make anything, and we just like drew together. Yeah. Um, yeah, that kind of brainstorming is real important. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you went home because you only hang out here on Tuesdays usually. And I went back to making mongooses and we forgot about this for six months. Yep. Um, <clears throat> then I've been working on some other projects we'll get to. Um, and eventually I got stuck at like, okay, I'm building this other camera. It needs to be built around a film back. Yep. That film back is going to cost hundreds of dollars worth of materials. And I usually take about seven tries to get to a working thing. I don't want to blow five thousand dollars worth of materials to get to one working thing yeah you know five hundred dollars is a good amount of materials to throw in the trash and so we decided to pick up where we had left off with this yeah. um that was like last week back. Right? that was mm -hmm. two weeks ago. two weeks ago right um and so we had this drawing this was a joe and ethan combined drawing from uh <clears throat> 12 29 20 after this guy had failed yeah um and it sort of had a similar kind of trough system with uh some 3d printed parts just trying to make a good four by five and so last week joe and i finally had our first success in about a year uh this was working prototype uh this is the second four by five we tried to make uh, and it worked first shot although it had some improvements and i've already broken parts of it um this was a half 3d printed half laser cut uh, film holder that had an integrated uh, light baffle with a poor spout so you didn't have to screw anything on, which was a weak point about a year ago. Uh, the tank is liquid tight and light tight, uh, but you could pour in and out of it. And again, it has the same flange as a normal 4x5 film holder. Um, and then we also laser cut this shim so that we could use Joe's Intrepid camera, which is a beautiful camera. Um, yeah. And we just stuck this shim between the focusing screen and the back of the camera so Joe could focus. Yep. And, um, and it worked and good. Joe brought some Harman paper and took this very excellent photo of me and developed it in camera. Um, yep. You know, it's a different process, but it works yep. the same. And um, yeah, I'm really happy with that photo. It was amazing opening the back, opening the dark slide on that self-developing back. And we were processing it outside into your yard. We yep. were just, right. And it, oh, we popped it open, and there's the picture of you staring back at us with your glasses. It was very good. It was pretty cool. Um, also, it only used 35 milliliters of chemistry, which was yeah. extremely, uh, yeah, thrifty. extremely thrifty. Yeah. yeah. So um, we had these guys, and then Joe goes away for another week, and I got up to <laughs> all of this. And so I thought, okay, you know, what I really want to do is make a four by five an 8x10, and a 20x24, right? These 3D printed back shells, uh, let's see if I have just a shell here that has the laser cut parts. I mean, they're not free to produce, but they're relatively inexpensive in 4x5, but as you get to 8x10, they start taking like a week to print and they would cost a ton um, and any defects would be just horrible. And yeah. so I knew, you know, a larger size would have to use a different manufacturing scheme, right? So uh, instead of just jumping right to 20 by 24, I figured I'd try making V1, V2, and V3 simultaneously. And so that's that's what I did in this box of prototypes. So these are all early prototypes. And so um, I made these and sent Joe a flurry of texts, <laughs> well, probably while you were working. And then finally this last weekend, I sat down and made some uh, final products. I made this guy in 4x5, which is a nice clean version of this uh, 4x5 tank with a 3D printed body and a laser cut acrylic top and some hardware. Um, it's got this dark slide 
which looks familiar, but it's got some you know thicker parts, so it won't break. Um, it is reversible, although at this point I have not laser etched like exposed or not exposed, which I might do. It's got an improved light baffle, which pours much quicker. Um, yeah, and it's basically the same same design, but uh, with you know uh, improvements over the last one. It even has like this little pour spout on the corner, uh, yeah. just was something we noticed some dribbling yep. last time. And so that was uh, great, and um, we're gonna test this one out today. And then I couldn't help myself, like, so the OG is the, uh, the Camera Dactyl OG is the four x five hand camera. Again, Joe and I have made some videos on it. And that's really what I wanted to use this with, right? right? But it has a fixed nose cone, and it, you know, because the back pushes out, farther, it makes the film plane longer. I couldn't focus at infinity, it was bothering me, and so I flipped some things in the OG and I made the GO, which is, so this is the Camera Dactyl Go. Um, this is again a prototype that we are gonna test out today. It looks very familiar to those of you who have seen my 4x5s. Uh, it has the same focusing ring here. Um, I'm using a 127 Ektar, but I can make them for any lens, and it has a locking nut so you can focus and lock it down. Um, it has the same grip with integrated buttons. I, my original prototype did not have a strap hole in the <laughs> handle, and so when I made a new one, I upgraded myself nice. to what everybody else is getting now. And the big difference is that this nose cone is shorter by a few millimeters, and that this focusing screen is much, much thicker, right? So now instead of using a shim on this particular camera... The shim's built in essentially to the design. Exactly. The yeah. shim is built into this blue piece here, which doesn't have to be blue. And we've got the ground glass here, so um, the ground glass is exactly at the same distance as it would be with this guy. So, you know, it works exactly the same way. Either you can focus on the back here, or you can mark some focusing distances on the um, on the focusing ring and scale focus. And then, you know, when you're ready, you just in here, it locks in just like any film holder. Pull this out, take a picture, close it up, and then develop your picture in the tank. And so yep. this is probably a good time to cut to us doing yes. that. The magic of video editing, that only took me three seconds. <laughs> okay, right. so that's loaded. So a quick recap of the peroxide based reversal process. You make an exposure on a paper, a negative, a regular negative black and white uh, printing paper. You give it more exposure than you normally would for a normal paper negative. You develop it in black and white developer. You should get a very dark uh, paper negative, very overexposed looking. And then you're going to bleach it in alternate baths of citric acid and peroxide back and forth until the paper is completely white and then you fog the paper with light and redevelop in black and white chemistry and you should get a positive. And if you've done it enough, uh, if you've given it the proper exposure, you probably don't even need to fix it afterwards. Probably all the remaining silver has is, is been processed out of it, but you can fix it if you want. Okay, okay. black and white developer. Into the tank. Enough. I should get little 35 ml bottles. Yes. All right, so this first citric acid bath um, should prime the uh, developed areas to be bleached out and then also stop the development so we could 
potentially look at it after this, but I like to pour in the bleach first just to be sure. So definitely stop it. So, so here goes some hydrogen peroxide. This is 12% strength from the beauty supply place. Yeah, which is um, 40 V. 40 V. Crystal yes. clear. You don't want the uh, cream kind. Yeah. Okay, so now it should be stopped and we can see it maybe bleaching out a little. Yes. It's starting to go. Put a little bit more in here, actually. Oh, yes. Uh oh. Bubbles and everything. Look. Yeah. So I think what, what looks white immediately is actually just a foam of bubbles. You should have bubbles and fizziness going mm -hmm. on. And you should wear gloves. Don't be like Ethan. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to get my, my fingers clean. <laughs> so Ethan is agitating it, and I think this is important because the bubbles, when they stick on the surface of the paper, they block the chemistry from getting to that part of the emulsion. So you have to agitate it sufficiently to dislodge the bubbles. And this is still the first bleach step. So just doing the agitation looks like it's really working well. I think we're probably not going to get this really right. dark area here. We we'll go through one more round though. Just one more round, yeah. yeah. Can I actually try that now? getting pretty dirty. Yes. And that's got to be the silver that is pulled off. Yep. Along with any couple of dyes or whatever. That's why we have the tray for quick and expedient uh, rinsing. Now here we go. Deck tall. Ooh. Yeah, that was a latent image that we were seeing. Oh, yeah. All right. Wow, pretty good exposure. Pretty good. Yeah, it was faster with the deck tall. And it was a bright day, and you got my shaded, hat shaded face. Looks like it's almost perfectly exposed. Yeah. Yeah, so we uh, removed some orange filters and trying to get a daylight balance for this paper and this uh, chemistry at about room temperature, which is probably around 80 in my shop right now. Um, <laughs> which is good for yeah. the process. Right? So this has stop bath in it. It's been stopped. All right. And it looks like a good black and white negative. I'm going to pour this back in the stop bath bucket. Let's make a color positive! You want to do rinse? Uh, oh, well, yes, I do, but okay. <laughs> I should have rinsed. Maybe we just kill the color developer. It's quite possible. Looks like it's coming. All right. It looks, face looks pretty good. Yeah, I like that. The white backboards look um, pretty good. Yeah, that shirt is just reflecting some light that yeah. is registered elsewise. And this pour spout is real handy. Oh yeah, I'm glad you designed that into the, yeah. uh, the back. First one did not have that. Okay, that looks very yeah. muted. Let's get rid of the negative. The negative layer, it will, it will now bleach out and fix it. Bleached enough, we can go out to the magic watering can. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I kind of think that's maybe a little too blue. I think that is a reasonable color. Yes, yes, yes. So for $17,000 for this process, you're going to need a AMC Jeep Cherokee uh, drying rack, cheap at any price. <laughs> we uh, tested a bunch of the uh, direct positive processes, the color reversal, uh, black and white reversal, and Ilford Harmon direct positives. And we did it in this new Camerdactyl Go and Camerdactyl 4x5 self-developing bag. I think it was a success. Joe and I can certainly dial in the process a little cleaner like we had um, 
a year and a half ago. Um, I think where we're going next is bigger versions of this, but I guess uh, this camera should be ready to release next week. So it'll be on cameradactyl.com. Buy now, cheap at any price. Okay.